Welcome listeners to episode 35 of the Running Guy podcast, where I aim to provide informative content and interviews to elite athletes and health professionals around the world, like in today's episode, where I'm chatting to an Adelaide girl who has now returned home after a very successful five years within the US college scholarship system and is now gaining the attention of the Australian running community with some very impressive performances over the shortened summer track season. Welcome to the Running Guy podcast, Izzy Bat Doyle. How are you going, Izzy? I'm well, thank you. Thank you for having me on the podcast. Ah, it's fantastic. Good to have you on the show. Saturday afternoon here. You would have laced yep. up this morning. How'd that go? Yeah, I went out for an easy run, um, Saturday easy run, just um, 14Ks and did my gym session today at home as well. was a bit lazy yesterday and didn't quite fit that one in on my Friday, so I had to make that one up today too. Yeah, cool. We're, we're getting smacked with some, uh, well, New South Wales getting smacked with some heavy rainfalls. So you guys wouldn't be getting that over there? No, it's actually beautiful weather here today. It's sunny. I think it's about 30 degrees, actually. It's, um, yeah, perfect running conditions this morning. Yeah, 30. Okay, mm. yeah, right, yeah. It, it was pretty mild uh, Australian summer this year. You would have, uh, wouldn't have got too many 40s over there in Adelaide that you normally would have? Yeah, no, it's been pretty mild. I feel like we never really got that hot weather that um, we're probably used to getting. Um, and I felt like it was maybe coming later in the year, but, yeah, we're ticking into – um, end of March and it still hasn't been that hot so I think we just had pretty mild mild summer but can't complain I mean it makes it easier for training not having to really worry about um, you know going out really early and trying to get things done before it gets too hot had a couple of um, early long runs um, with just you know maybe 35 36 degrees but nothing crazy yeah no it's definitely good I don't think we're complaining here in in Canberra either um, yeah. we actually had a lot of a lot of humidity which was fantastic I I don't mind training in, in, in the humidity. Uh, it's not great to race in, but um, yeah. normally when I, I head up to say, Sydney. Yeah, last weekend in Sydney was uh, was pretty humid and tough in the race. Um, didn't, yeah. Didn't quite enjoy that one quite as much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I normally head up there quite often. I'm from the northern beaches and um, I normally just get smacked around with, with the humidity because, uh, yeah. yeah, we had it here in Canberra, which is, which was fantastic. and. Mm. Um, yeah, and lot, lots of rain, and uh, yeah, we're getting a lot of it again now. So uh, it's about to hit us. It's already come through Sydney and, and Wollongong. So I think another Sunday morning soggy long run is ahead of me. It's, uh, it's sounds, all good. Uh, sounds a bit of fun. But yeah, last weekend I had a uh, almost two hours um, absolutely drenched in Sydney, and it was that kind of yeah drenched, but also a bit humid weather, and just feel um, completely soaked. And so yeah, yeah. It makes, makes it pretty tough. Yeah, yeah, we actually had a half marathon here last Sunday and uh, oh. yeah, we were pretty much needed flippers on. It was just the, the rain was so heavy and uh, the bike pass was sort of yeah. underwater. But it was uh, it was interesting, um, you know. Um, I think when you're racing, you tend to try to uh, forget about that sort of stuff. But, um, yeah, but, yeah so it's good It's good to have the rain. Look, can't complain. It's an outdoor sport. You take it. Absolutely. And, it's, yeah, that's the thing. Like, nothing's ever really going to be cancelled on race day um, unless it's, like, totally extreme weather. So, you have to get used yeah, to training in in anything because um yeah you can get anything on race day yeah yeah as long as it's not freezing cold when I'm training I, I don't mind yeah. it too much actually I've got a guy in the um in the group that we coach who's from he was living in Adelaide but now he's um he's he's moved and he did the um, half marathon in Canberra last weekend and I did hear about it being quite a wet one you've had a, a great journey so far with all the ups and downs that uh, unfortunately most runners sort of endure mm. um that um as you know if you can sort of hang in there and and ride it out, uh, you generally come out the other side a bit stronger, determined, and uh, a bit wiser, which is clearly what uh, seems to be marrying up um, with what you're doing at the moment on the road and the track. So um, that's obviously a, a pretty good outcome for yourself personally, but uh, all of us lovers of Australian running, it's uh, it's great to uh, to see how it's all unfolded. Um, now we're going to work through through it all. There's a lot to go through, but let's uh, let's kick off with with your PBs, jumping straight to the 1500 meter. Um, <laughs> over there in uh, Portland, Oregon. So that was 15th of June, 2018. You ran a 4.17.80. Tell us about what you can remember about that one. Yeah, um, 1500s. Uh, haven't done a lot of them, and that was the last one I've done um, since then. So haven't done one for uh, almost four years. But um, I was coming back from injury. I'd had um, a, I'd broken four bones in my left foot and taken almost four months off running. And um, just jumping in the back of the season, I had to uh, miss the NCAA uh, track season. And then there are a couple of kind of, um, yeah, just meets at the end of the season for people to jump in. And I did a 5K and then a 1500. Um, yeah, and run a PB in the 5K and then the 1500 the next week. 
um, really good races at Portland they put on. Um, so I was really happy just to have the opportunity to race, especially after injury. And yeah, to run a PB, I was stoked. Um, 417, I was really happy with to, you know, not be a 1500 meter runner as such, more of a 10K, 5K runner. I felt that that was a pretty good time to put out. Um, I would like to have another crack sometime soon because uh, I think I can get under that 14, 15, a uh, 415 mark um, now, uh, which would be kind of cool to do. I was kind of in between coaches at the time because um, of the stuff going in America um, at my college and my parents were over to watch me and they were doing a half marathon the next morning. And I said to mum, uh-huh. oh, I'll jump, I'll jump in with you for the half and, you know, just run, run with you, you know, I won't race it. And so I did the 1500, you know, at 8.30 that, that night and then the next morning got up and um, jumped in this half marathon and I got a bit competitive with the guys out the front and I ended up running, uh, I think, 118 and, and winning it. <laughs> so, oh, okay. um, yeah, backed up uh, next morning for a half. Uh, but, yeah, good fun. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, all right, let's move to the 3,000 metres. Um, over there in Seattle, 23rd of April 2017, you ran 925.89. Yeah, uh, the three k is not um, one that we run that often um, outdoors. Yep. So we do a lot of yep. indoor running, and I think my indoor PB is nine oh nine. But outdoors, that was just a, a race I had to win for points and um, more of a training run. I'm pretty keen to give that a crack. Um, I'm running a three k in a couple of weeks at the state championships here in SA, and I hope okay. to yeah have a big PB there. Yeah, 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 for sure. And well, you're certainly moving well, so it's certainly on the cards. Three thousand meter stable chase. Yeah. Ten oh two even over there in Eugene, Oregon, 9th of April 2016. Yeah, so I was a steeplechaser. Um I actually went to college um for steeplechase. I ran ten twenty four um and came second at the Australian Junior Nationals. Um had a bit of a kerfuffle, but I was um thought I was gonna make world juniors, didn't get picked for the team in the end. Um which was a bit sad for me um, at the time, uh, but never mind. Went over to the states um, to run steeplechase over there and lowered my time down to 10:02 in my second year um, in college. But I was finding I was getting quite injured um, from the steeple, and so um, I didn't continue on steeple. I started just to run flat races for the rest of my collegiate um, career, and haven't haven't jumped back in the steeple yet. Um, not sure that I plan on doing that one again. <laughs> Might have to stay at 10:02. That's not a bad time, though, is it? Yeah, not too bad. Actually, it's a state record, so I'll take it. There you go. There you <laughs> go. Maybe jump in if someone takes it from you. All right, 5,000 metres um, just recently, um, 2nd of March, down there at Box Hill, 15.11.07. Yeah, yep. uh, yep. That was a great <laughs> race. Obviously, there's a um, bit of sweet there, but, uh, yeah, chat about that one. Yeah, I think that's, that's it, bittersweet, but um, really, like, I'm absolutely stoked with that time and going into the race, like, I, my PB was 15.26. I'd run that in December on my own here in SA. Um, I knew I was in PB shape. Like I really wanted to um, break my PB, which would be another state record. And I was thinking around that 15.20 mark was realistic for me. I thought the 15.10 was a little bit pushing it. Um, I see myself more as a 10K runner, so I'm not sure I felt confident enough to really go out at that pace. Um, But the race, yeah, went out hot and I was kind of on my own and ended up um, being in the lead and um, only three people finishing the race. And it was an absolutely bizarre race to be in. Um, but I'm really proud of the way I raced and um, felt really good on the night and was able to just wind it up. Um, and I didn't re- even realise how close I was coming to, like, closing in at that time. Um, rewatching it now, it's like, oh, my gosh, so close. But, um, yeah, to get 15-11, yeah, I'm absolutely so happy with that. And to think that um, four years ago, that would have been 10 seconds within the qualifier. You know, it just shows, um, I guess, um, it, it's, a, it's a great time and i got to be pleased with that. And hopefully um, I can improve on that soon and, and uh, yeah, get under that 15-10 mark. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You obviously don't mind um, running out front. Is that something you've done for, for many years or? Yeah, um, I think in college, like, I had to um, practice that because, um, it was just the way that I was going to do well at races and, and win races um, over there. Um, so I did practice that quite a bit in my last um, last six months at Washington. Um, and I do feel quite comfortable at the front. I feel more in control um, and able to kind of dictate the race. Um, I'm not sure it was the smartest way for me to race last weekend in Sydney. Um, I learned a lot from that race and I'll um, put that into practice in the future for sure. Um, in case we don't get a chance to talk about, it, is that is that because you feel you don't have a big 200 meter 
kick and you're, you're trying to run the legs off, off your competitors? Is that what it's sort of about? Well, yeah, I think that I see myself more as an endurance runner um, and the way I've run 10Ks in the past is kind of really squeezing down from eight laps to go, six laps to go, four laps to go um, okay. kind of thing rather than just waiting for a sprint finish. And as we saw at Zatopec, like I was running fast as, that last lap, but, you know, someone was faster, Rose was faster, over 200. So, um, yep. yeah, I, I feel that for me I, I need to be um, closing, closing in a bit um, sooner than the last 200 or last lap. But yep. I think also uh, looking at it now, I probably need to be more confident in my clothes because I saw yeah. like I ran a 66 second last lap. Um, I still had a really good finish and was able to pass some really good girls um, in the race on Sydney in Sydney last weekend. So I think, yeah, I need to be more confident in my clothes and maybe be a little more patient um, rather than always wanting to kind of like stay at the front and push the pace. Yeah. And- yeah, you don't want the girls always thinking, oh, don't worry, Izzy will take the front, yeah. which you need to suit on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, really, I really became the pacer for that race. So, yeah, um, yeah not sure. Yeah. It probably played into my favour so well. Oh, it will in the future. Um, 10,000 metres, as you mentioned, down there in Zatopec, again at Box Hill, Australia Day. Um, 31, 43, 26. Mm-hmm. Great, great race to watch it. Yeah. Um, and with that one, like I think for quite a few weeks, I felt that I was in um, 31, 45 shape. That's kind of what I was mm. saying. Um, I was a little bit, uh, yeah, when I heard the, that they were going to go out at 31, 25, um, yeah, I really knew I had to be on the back end of that pace because it was going to be quite aggressive for me. And that's why yeah. in that race, I really hung back and was pretty patient just um, on the back of that train, really, mm. because that was um, that was how I had to run it. I couldn't have gone any faster. I was um, I was yeah feeling I was feeling it at 74s, um, 75 at the start of the race. So um, yeah, that was pretty much what I thought I was capable of running. I'm really glad that I was able to do that because um, yeah, previously I'd run 32, 13 um, by my well, I'd won a, a race here in SA. Um, and yeah, felt that I was capable of going faster in a, in a good field. So I'm glad it came together on the day, but I think there's definitely more in the tank there too. Sure. Sure. So that was your first sub 32 on the track. It was. Yeah. First yep. sub 32. Um, yeah. Yep. I ran 32, 10, um, at Launceston on the roads, um, in December. Fantastic. All right. Now talking of the roads, uh, the road 5k, this is, yeah, this is not one. So obviously <laughs> It hasn't been updated because it's back 2014 and 17. Yeah, 10. I mean, yeah. you could you could do that on one leg at the moment. So yeah, I, I mean, I think I went through. Um, I've gone through 16, 10, 5k sure. on the road. Yeah. So yeah. um, yeah. it's funny. I think my um 800 PB on there is still 218 from like Correct. 18 or 20. Yeah, that's why I skipped to the 1500. <laughs> I'd like so, to uh, a bit of a bust too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. All right. Let's talk about that 10k down there in Lawney, the 3210 uh, yeah. in December last year. Yeah. Yeah, that was awesome. I mean, for me, it was probably the first time that I've actually raced against, um, you know, really the top crop of female distance runners in SA and in sorry in Australia, and um, that was really exciting for me because I'd been running quite well here in SA and um, you know winning races over here, and I was really keen to get um, a domestic race in where I had some different competition, different people to line up against, and only a couple of weeks before the race. Um, the borders were closed from SA to Tasmania. So it looked like I wasn't going to get there. Um, and I was really disappointed to feel like I was going to miss that opportunity. So when a week before the borders opened, I was able to go, it was so exciting to feel like, wow, like I'm so happy to have this opportunity. And I think I really saw that race as just like a great opportunity. And I was so excited to race. And I really, um, yeah, I'm proud that I made the most of it and had a good race there. And um, it was the last K, it was like, six or seven women and you know anyone could have won it really we were all still pretty close together with a k to go so to come third there to jen and rose um i was really happy but yeah it was pretty close finish i think jen was like 32 flat rose was like 3204 or something and i was like 3210 or 3208 so it was yeah pretty close finish for the running community, it was just fantastic to see that it was going to go ahead and, and the depth yeah. um so and the, you know that Good quality live streams we get these days. So yeah. um yeah. How good has it, it been this year? It's so good. It's been it's been really good and uh yeah, sign of good things to come for sure. Yeah, um, I think everyone really just um like super grateful for the opportunity to race for the launch yeah. session. So like it was good vibes all around. Like everyone was just like so excited to be there. Yeah, yeah. It, it seemed that way. Everyone was just like, How good is this to be, to yeah. be back out racing and, and especially knowing you're gonna get a chance to run really fast as well. Mm. So yeah, mm. it's definitely great. All right, let's head back to the kitty days. Um, 
a uh, bit of history here. So you're one of four children, you being the youngest, that's right? Yeah, I've got one sister and, um, well, a bunch of step step siblings, um, but yeah. Okay. All right, yeah. And, and as you mentioned before, you, your folks ran that half, but uh, they were into running marathons when you were growing up? Yeah, my parents have both, um, yeah, been doing like marathons, half marathons um, throughout my childhood. So yeah, I guess I've always kind of been around running and active people, which has been, yeah, good to see. Yep, yep. Product of the environment. That's good. Um, and you came up through the little A's. That's right. I did. Yes, I did. Yeah. Yep. And in high school, you were, you were pretty much, uh, you were making state cross country teams. Is that right? Yeah, I um I made state cross country teams. I think since I was eleven years old, and um yep. yeah, started doing the track ones once they came around. But yeah, as I say, like I'm, I was never a standout. Like I was probably um, second or third in the state every year um, at best. And I think one year I came like yeah fifteenth or something at nationals. Um, but other than that, I was usually kind of like mid pack seventy or something like that, and just having fun, happy to be there. Um, yep until I was probably yeah, un- under 18s, under 20s and started to kind of, yeah, pick up some more um, national level medals and, and get a little more into the sport. Yeah, yeah, okay. And that's when you sort of um, came to the attention of, of the uh, overseas college um, scholarship system. So t- so tell us about how, how you went from, from, you know, performing at high school to jumping on a plane and heading to New York. How did that all come about? Yeah, so I think really um, for me it was uh, year 11, um, the end of the year, I did the Nationals in December um, and I came third in the 3K and fourth in the steeple, not the steeple, the 1500. And that was kind of, that was the first time I'd won a um, a national medal. And um, I think after that started to get maybe a little bit of interest um, from a few schools and just realised that that was a possibility for me. Um, and then the following year, um, yeah, I was uh, second at the um, junior nationals in the steeplechase, and um, yeah, it just kind of all all happened from from there. And um, I guess once I was getting you know national medals, and people coaches were um, yeah looking at the Australian system, I got contacted by a few coaches, and I was pretty overwhelmed just to even think about it being a possibility to go over to the States. I only knew of a couple of people who'd, who'd done it um, or who were over there. And um, I ended up um, getting a bit of help and, you know, trying to sort through the system a little bit. But even so, I really had no idea. And I ended up picking a school um, kind of based on where it was. I've been to New York before. I liked New York and I felt like if I went somewhere that I liked, if running didn't go well, um, you know, I'd still be in a cool place and I'd still like the school I was at and have a good academic um um, place to be at too so that's why I chose New York um, and St John's University to start with. Yep were you asking around the other other kids at that stage like are you guys getting emails and phone calls from colleges or was it were you the only one that you knew of at that time? Uh, yeah I think I did discuss a little bit with um, with a few others but um, being from SA like I was um, like kind of the best in SA and there weren't too many other like um, I guess girls um who were running around my level but then you know there was tons from like Victoria and New South Wales but I wasn't I didn't really know them as well because I just yeah didn't didn't kind of cross paths as much and hadn't been on teams with them so yeah I was a a little bit kind of unknown I guess to it all and um yeah it's funny to look back on now and be like wow I really didn't know anything about what I was doing and just you know signed up and said yep and hopped on a plane and went over there and um it's yeah pretty crazy to look back on now. Yeah, yeah, and you seen you said you'd been to New York before. Was that was that your folks doing the marathon or? No, I just been on a holiday. Um, I just been to yeah to America with um my parents when I was like thirteen or fourteen. Okay. And yeah, yeah, just been to New York and you know I yeah. watched Gossip Girl and movies and stuff and <laughs> yeah. I felt like it was a, a cool place. Yeah, it, it is a cool place. It is, yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, so we're going to start working through um your little chapter over there in the college system. Now, as you mentioned, went to St. John's there, uh, you're pretty much, you know, continuing running in the steeple and the cross country. Mm -hmm. You became the Big East champion when you ran 10.23.98. You um, broke two school records while you were there, one being when you ran 10.10.88 at the NCAA East prelims, Mm -hmm. and the other being when you ran 9.45.55 in the indoor 3,000 metres. Yeah. So um, let's just talk about that period um, when you first went over there and, um, you know, what, I guess how you perceived you were running and, you know, what your running goals were at that time short and in the years to come and uh, also, you know, how you were sort of coping with that with that environment of, of being an overseas uh, athlete over there in that college system. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, so when I went to America, it was kind of like 
I probably would have stopped running competitively if I hadn't have gone over. So it was kind of like, all right, yeah, I'll keep running. Um, I'll get a scholarship, pay for my college for the next four years. That's pretty cool. Um, and then like, we'll see how we go. Um, so going to America and like, it was just, everything was so overwhelming when I first got there. Like, um, I didn't realize it was, there was no men's team actually at St. John's. It was just a women's team. They'd cut the men's team a few years ago. And, um, so that was like, okay, cool. Just women's team. All right. Um, but, um, yeah, it was just, everything was new, like just living on campus, um, eating at the dining hall, like so many things to adjust to, um, the practice times and everything we did and the weather, it was the um, coldest winter that had in New York for 80 years. So I really struggled with the weather for the first, um, first winter, like getting up and having, um, class at 7:30 in the morning. And it was like minus 17 outside and just walking to class thinking like, this is crazy. Like I'm so cold. Um, and I remember just mm. doing runs, um, and like my eyelashes just being like stuck together with like icy snow and just like being like, Oh my gosh, like this is so painful. Like how do people do this? Mm. Um, and also at St. John's, we didn't have an indoor track. So we'd, we'd go on like a bus into the city to the armory and run on the um, armory track, um, in Manhattan. Um, but a lot of the time when it was like pretty bad weather, we would just do um, – I'd actually run around the, um, like, hallway of the basketball stadium. So it was probably about 200 metres, um, probably even less. Um, and I'd just do, like, 70 laps. Like, and I'm talking, like, literally a hallway, like, people walking through the hallway or, mm. like, run up and down stairs or, like, run up, run on the treadmill. Didn't do as much treadmill running as I – like, looking back at it now, I'm like, why don't we just run on the treadmill? But, um, yeah, so it was pretty hard to, like, actually do – the training and it had to be like adjusted a lot um I guess to like the weather and stuff and also I was pretty much like homesick for the first three four months like crying every day like calling my parents being like I miss you so much like this is so hard but um I think I felt really supported to know that like I was giving it a go and I could go home if I wanted but um I think like knowing that I wasn't necessarily stuck there for four years if I wanted to be um that was kind of good. But luckily I made some really good friends and I started to feel um, like, you know, it was coming a second home. Um, but yeah, running was kind of like, I was just happy to be doing what I was doing. And I started breaking school records and um, that was pretty cool. I mean, being saying that, I mean, 945 is not really a super strong <laughs> 3k time. Um, but yeah, it was still cool at the time to, to feel like I was, um, you know, writing the history books there. And, and, um, but after a while, um, I did start to feel like I was a big fish in a small pond and that's kind of how I'd felt in Adelaide. So um, when I came back for my second year, I kind of had to really think about my goals and what I wanted to get out of running. And um, over that first year, I think my running goals had um, gotten a little more serious and I realised that actually I'd moved to America because of running. So um, if I really wanted to give it a go, um, I probably needed to challenge myself a little more. And that's when I decided to think about transferring schools. Um, yeah. So as much as I loved living in New York, it was just a fantastic experience. I can't even explain how much fun I had there. It's like exploring the city, watching New York City Marathon. Like it was just unreal to travel around and, and you know, see all the East Coast and um, go to the Ivy League schools. And, yeah, it was just so much fun. But um, really, to, to put it um, simply, I just needed more of a challenge. Um, I was the best on the team there. I didn't really feel like the coach there was able to kind of um, shape me into the athlete that I wanted to be. So I started looking at other schools and um, the University of Washington um, was one of those schools. And quite quickly, um, I contacted them. And before I knew it, um, the next March, I was over in Seattle. So, yeah. So at the end of, um, at the end of your first year, do you head back home um, during that break? Is that, is that what you normally do like in between yeah, those years? So yep. Yeah, so in the um, after my freshman year, um, I made the um, NCAA prelims, so like the first round. But I think I was just two or three spots off making nationals for the steeple. So yeah. I ran ten ten, um, really pleased at that time, um, but didn't quite get me to nationals. And then I came home in June until um, August September, and then yeah. yeah, back to America. And then I was only. Um, back in New York from um, August to December and then I came yep. back home to Adelaide, um, packed up everything for good and then when I went back to America in March 2016, um, I was off to Seattle. I've heard you discuss it. You may not want to keep talking about it, but you ended up 
there was a few loops you actually had to get through before you get over to, to Washington. Um, yeah, due to absolutely. one St. John's yeah, sort of course. not wanting to to let you go. So yeah, just quickly talk about that. I think yeah, it's, I think it's actually quite interesting though because yeah, you kind of think yeah, why would that happen? But essentially, I wanted to transfer. Um, my coach was like, yep, yeah, sure, like I understand. But then the athletic department were like, no, um, you can't just pack up and leave um, that easily. So pretty much what they can do is Especially say, when you're the best runner um, there. They don't really want to win. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's the thing. They, they kind of want to make an example that you can't just like um, leave um, yeah. that easily. Yeah. And I guess they feel like they've invested in you. So um, they want to kind of hold on to you if you can, if they, if they can. Um, yeah. But essentially they can't make you stay. They can just say um, – we're not allowing you to compete for another co- college for a year. So they can put kind of like a block on you. Okay. So um, I did an appeal and I had like this like tribunal, like um, video chat call um, um, with like 12 people from St. John's. And uh, luckily I won that appeal and that meant that I was able to freely start at Washington and compete for Washington as soon as I wanted. If mm-hmm. I'd lost that appeal, all that would have meant is that I could have gone to Washington and I could have started classes, I could have been training with the team, but I couldn't have actually put on a jersey and competed for them for another year. Right, yeah. So yeah. is there someone representing you during that tribunal or you just have to... Luckily, <laughs> luckily my mum's a lawyer, so she helped me. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, but, yeah, it was pretty much um, uh, she helped me write, like, kind of my appeal and then yeah. it was just myself um on the video um yeah with like 12 people that I had to kind of like present to so um okay. yeah yeah it was pretty tough but um definitely um learned a lot from it and I was very grateful once I got to Washington that I was able to compete and um yeah just get straight into it and why not uh why not Oregon I mean the, the history mm-hmm. and depth there is is, is yeah, crazy actually yeah, I did look at Oregon. Um, when I was kind of looking, it was like, oh, um, Pac-12, the conference, was a really strong distance conference. Yep. So I was looking at those schools and it was kind of like Oregon, um, Washington um, and Colorado. Um, I'd been reading um, Running with the Buffaloes, the book, and I was kind of like um, interested in going to Colorado as well. But I knew that um, their coach, Mark Wetmore, doesn't really approve of foreigners being in the NCAA system. So I was kind of like, well, that's probably a no-go um, being Australian. And then yeah. Oregon, um, yeah, obviously such an amazing history, um, very cool school and, like, grounds and everything. But um, they didn't have any steeplechases at the time um, around the mark. Like, I think I would have been um, looking at the – when I looked at it, like, their fastest steeplechaser at the time – in saying that there actually was a couple of girls um, there the next year. So it would have been okay. But I think just looking at it, I was kind of like, oh, there's not really anyone about around the mark that's going to be pushing me in that event. So, um, yeah, I decided to go somewhere where there are a few more people in my event group and a few more, um, yeah, distance, distance runners there. Um, and also Washington was kind of um, regarded as um, a better academic school, which was also important to me as well. Yep. So there's University of Washington and there's Washington State, isn't there? There is, yeah. That 3,000 steeple PB that you ran in uh, in Eugene, Oregon, um, back in 16, was that on the, um, you know, the famous old Haywood Field that's now it been was, ripped up? Yeah. Yep, yep. yeah, it was there. Yeah, very cool place to run. And, like, I remember that race being just amazing because it was a pretty much, like, not a dual meet. There was, like, four schools, but it was um, pretty much myself and my teammate, Charlotte, um racing these two Oregon girls and we went one two and it was kind of like it was pretty cool to beat the Oregon girls on their home track but um yeah amazing stadium like amazing atmosphere and like just grandstand packed full of people and even though they weren't cheering for me it was still pretty cool to be um in that kind of environment yeah yeah it was such tradition and history there um Mm -hmm. you've obviously seen it when it's been rebuilt for the worlds next year it looks incredible doesn't it yeah, I've only seen like pictures on Instagram and um and videos and stuff, but it looks amazing. It's kind yeah, of sad yeah. to like, um the old grandstand was so so like um I guess yeah just special, but it, yeah they've done a really good job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard Ollie Hall mention uh, on a podcast recently that he um was hoping to get a piece of that track, but um yeah I don't think it's going <laughs> to happen when they ripped it up. But um yeah, because he 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 won that yeah the NCAA fifteen hundreds there um so yeah, I yeah. guess it was pretty special for him. Definitely. Uh-huh. Yeah, I was lucky I got to do um, one nationals, one 10K nationals um, there back in 20, 
2017, I think it was. Yeah, 2017. Yeah. I wonder if Pree's family sort of, uh, I mean, they really should build the whole lane one, 400 metres of it around the, the family home. You know? Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of people who want a piece of it. But, yeah, um, yeah, really looking forward to that. We'll, we'll chat about the world zone soon. Let's just talk about, I'm just, obviously, we're talking about the athletic career, but obviously you've got all your studies. I'm just wondering, I guess it's easy, if you can just run us through how your day looked like when, when you were over there. I mean, because it must have been hectic. Obviously, it's very competitive over there, um, a lot yeah. of pressure, you know, in, in the class yeah. and on the track. So, yeah, just tell yeah. us how, how that how the daily, how the day works. Yeah, and just, to, yeah, um, back on that, like, when I first went to Washington, I was, like, eighth on the team. Like, it was very competitive. Like, we were all kind of working for that spot to get, um, like, on that top seven for cross country. And, yeah, everything was competitive, every um, – every training, every race and, um, yep. yeah, even even studying, trying to get a high, high GPA and um, the women's distance team was known as being, you know, a pretty high-achieving bunch of, of ladies and we're all working hard in the classroom as well as on the track. Um, so, yeah, very busy. I, the usual day would probably be um, would meet at 8 a.m. for practice um, and that would take like oh, maybe till 10, 10.30. Um, we might do get run then gym could be there until 12 12 30 and then um you know have a shower quickly um lucky to have facilities all very close together so that makes it pretty easy um and then straight off to class um maybe until five six o'clock um and then um lucky to have um, a dining hall just for the athletes where we'd go for dinner um pretty early it was open at 4 30 until 7 30 so usually an early dinner and then home to do study um go to bed and do it all again um, some days are double, um, but most of the time it was just kind of that bigger chunk of training in the morning, um, like, yeah, like a track session and then straight into the gym or something like that, four, four hours in the classroom at most. Um, and we were lucky that we could kind of um, stack that around our practice time. So we'd get given, like our academic advisor um, would work with our practice schedule and then would kind of like fit our classes if we could, yeah, around practice um, so that we didn't often have that many clashes. There was always, you know, a, f- a semester or something where you might have to miss practice because you had to do a specific class, or, you know, at a time that didn't suit. Um, but most of the time it worked pretty well. So obviously by the time you become a senior, you're probably used, used to that system. But at first it, it must be a little bit overwhelming to deal with. Oh, definitely, yeah, for yeah. sure. And especially when you're like, um, you know, you, you're young and you have to um, – just like look at, look out for yourself more and like think about um you know yeah fueling um washing your clothes like I don't know all those little things that maybe at yeah. home you helped you with um yeah. but yeah again super lucky like the amount of support I got at Washington especially um you know we ha- we had our laundry done for us we had dinner provided for us we had snacks provided for us like there were masseuses masseuse there and athletic trainers when you needed them um so you know, it wasn't hard to be successful and be organised because you had a lot of support, you know, really every day to try and help you be the best version of yourself. I've got the huskies.com um, site up here and uh, it's it's actually really good. Um, you obviously know it, but um, yeah. you can pull up an athlete's bio and um, mm-hmm. it's got some great info on, on there and obviously it goes through all the different um, the, the years that you're over there. So I'm just going to read from 2019. NCAA, you picked up third there in the 10,000 metres, um, becoming All-American. We'll talk about that soon. Uh, you won the 2019 Pac-12 for the 10,000 metres, mm-hmm. um, which is absolutely huge, and we'll, and we'll talk about all this. Um, and in the 5,000 metre indoors, the uh, All-American second team. So that, that's that's pretty impressive. So let's just talk about this this All-American. All-American is basically you finish in the top eight. You, you make the final, Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a bit confusing. In cross country, it's a top forty, so it's like um, top, 40. top forty. Okay, I was going to ask that. Yeah. Um, I my best finish at cross country was like a hundred and tenth. I just didn't. I never nailed cross country over there. It was so hard. Um, yep. But yeah, for cross country, it's like you know you've got three hundred people in a race, and top forty get all American. Um, so that's like a pretty big chunk of people, really. Um, yep. But then on the track, it's top eight a first team all american and then like yep. if you're eighth to 16th you're like second team all american so gotcha. I, I think i came yep. 12th in the indoor 5k and 12th at nationals in the 10k um my first time around and like they're like they're like the second team all american honors but really like no one really cares unless you come like i, I don't really think it should be all american unless you come like first team do you know what i mean sure yeah <laughs> they yeah, kind of like try and hand out all these awards like 
second team All American, like first team yeah. All American, like all Big East, all all Pac twelve, like all region. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. And you're running. I was just looking at the times there. You're pretty much running low to mid thirty threes when you're um, um making those finals. Yeah, it's a bit like strange because um. Like you, I ran 32.20 at the start of the season, my first 10K, massive PB, school record, like awesome um, and kind of same for the 5K. And then the rest of the season, it starts just to be pretty much just like championship racing and you're racing every second weekend. So, um, yeah, it turned into like, you know, if I was in 32 shape, we were actually racing in like 33 mid um, because um, they were just more like tactical races and we were racing like kind of back to back each week. So um, yeah. a bit annoying because like, you know, you, you want to run like PVs, um, but it's not really kind of the place to do it. Well, it's definitely good to pick up that uh, All-American um, and that third in NCAA in your final year. I mean, oh, that's a bit of relief incredible. more than anything, yeah. It was absolutely incredible. And like, I guess the backstory in that is it's like so hard to make outdoor nationals. You have to be, you have to go to regionals, you have to make regionals for the time. And then um, the top 12 from the West and the top 12 from the East make the Nationals, which is a field of 24. So, yeah, it's really hard to make. And, like, I made it for the first time in 2017 for 10K. I came 10th at Regionals and then 12th at Nationals. And I was just so stoked to be there, like, over the moon, amazing. Um, but I did, like, finish that race going, like, oh, I want to get on the podium, you know, one day. And the next time around would be in 2019 after – I had some injuries um, and to come third was just like a dream come true to finish. Yeah. All American on the podium, like get third place. Um, it was mm. really like that fairy tale ending that I, I couldn't have really, I couldn't have pictured it being better than that. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have to dip the line to get third or it clear <laughs> or how did the race go? Uh, actually, I actually know there was the girl in fourth was like really quite close to me, probably like five meters behind me. So it was, um, okay. that was quite a, a battle uh, there, but yeah, um, the girl who won was always going to win it, Wayne Kaladi. I think she's run um, like 14.57 now and like 31 okay. low. Um, so, she, yeah, she's really good. Um, she runs for Under Armour now. A friend of mine, Carmela, who runs for Oregon, she kind of came out of nowhere and got second. Um, so, re- really, she had she had the race of the day on that one and I was just kind of like, yeah, running into, into third and watching it happen in front of me. And this this Pac-12, the uh, the Western Conference, which is you know considered probably the strongest conference in in the states, Pac-12 being uh, Pac specific, isn't it? And 12 being the like the strongest, um, I guess most dominant dominant universities in that area. And, and yeah. you won that. I, I was just looking also the the history of, of Pac-12, just University of Oregon. I think is it the men's team that have won like 13 consecutive Pac-12s? Yeah, they're they're, yep. they're always um. Why why are they so so strong? I mean. They just have the such a best strong, runners want, want to yeah, actually go there or best runners want to go there. They've got such a strong history. Um, yeah. The people just like flood there. And I think there's that like kind of magic of like running for Oregon and um, yeah. being part of that team. It's just so competitive to get on um, that they've really kind of got the, the, the pick of the, yeah, a, a good pick of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was even looking at the football team. They pretty much clean up as well. So they're pretty, a very strong university. Yeah, they're definitely a massive sporting school. Um, yeah, yeah, very yeah. strong. So how did that the, the Pac-12 <coughs> win? How did that race go? Oh, that was amazing. Like I knew I was fit, and I knew that like I was capable of getting the win. Um, but it was a hard race. It was at a slight altitude, um, and the okay. girls I was racing against they they were from altitude. They were from Colorado, um, mm. and I was kind of like this is going to be a bit harder because I'm not um, used to altitude. But mm. was um, it Arizona? It was at Arizona. Yeah. 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 So it's not quite as like it's not quite as high as like. Um, yeah, like Colorado, but it was still like, um, yeah, you can still definitely feel it <laughs> in the sure. air. Um, yeah. But, yeah, it was kind of um, a race. I just kind of like a bit more like Zadapec where I just kind of sat in the pack um, for the first half, wanted to be really comfortable. And then um, I think it was like two miles out or two Ks out. Like I just really um, started to wind it up the last, yeah, last four, last eight laps, two miles out. Um, and, yeah, just really closed hard and, and – and pretty comfortably got the win. Um, but, yeah, I was really happy with that race. And that was, um, yeah, a really big deal for me. Like I'd never won a big race like that before. And um, it was kind of crazy because we had these like thunderstorms happening and I didn't actually race until like 12.45 p.m., uh, like at a.m., like at night. Um, so my race was scheduled for like 9.30 um, and then like we had to wait like a few hours. So it was a little bit um, – 
like I, I had to kind of, yeah, really be like quite relaxed about that. Um, usually I like to kind of stick to my schedule and I eat at a certain time and I'm, I'm all ready to go. Um, so to kind of have to like, just like sit around and wait and see like when the race will happen. That was, um, that was uh, hard for me, but I kind of persevered and was really proud of how I raced. Obviously there's been a lot of successful Aussies that have come through that um, US college system um, over the years, you know, Paddy Tiernan, Dave McNeil, Morgan McDonald, Jess Hull, yourself, Ollie Hall. You know, there's probably a lot of crash and burn stories that we don't really hear about. Were there any other Aussie girls over there at that time who um, were really struggling to, um, to to fit into that system and to perform? Yeah, I know there are a few. Like um, I knew Anna Lamarne was over at Stanford at the time and I don't think she had probably um, the best time that, that she might have expected. And yeah, and there were others, but it's just, yeah, it's one of those systems that, it kind of works or doesn't for you and it's really hard to um it's just yeah it's a hard system and like it works for some people and it doesn't work for other people and that's just I guess yeah the way it is yeah yeah so if you had to give like if someone came up to you and say look I'm thinking about going over there what sort of advice would you be giving them yeah like I think that um it's such a great opportunity um to go over and like I loved my time over there even though I had like you know lots of ups and downs um but I would just say like um, you know, think about what your priorities are and whether academics or running is more important because um, academically it probably is easier to stay back in Australia and, like, get the degree that you want to get and move into the field that you want to work in. Um, but quite frankly, athletically, you know, Australia can't offer the same opportunities that the college system does. I think just, like, knowing where you're going, knowing the team you're going to, like, having a good relationship with the coach you're going to work with, they're all really important things. And just like, yeah, being aware of like what you're in for and um, weighing up the pros and cons. But um, all in all, I think it's a fantastic experience and I'm really pleased that I made the most of it and I went over there. And I think that if I hadn't have gone, I wouldn't be the runner I am today. So what did you actually study? So I did psychology um, and okay. I did yep. my um, yeah undergraduate and honours degree there. And now I'm doing um, – combined masters and PhD in clinical psychology back here in Adelaide. I did my honours thesis on mindfulness and I definitely like tend to use that in running and just like on a day-to-day basis. Um, but yeah, sometimes I can overthink things and like, you know, too much can be an issue too. But um, no, nah, I think um, having an awareness about your mental state is only helpful really. So 2019, you know, awesome final year at, at college. Um, actually, we should we should discuss as much as they suck. There was injuries, and uh, there was a season you had to uh, be redshirted for, and that's pretty much why why you got that uh, that extension in that fifth year. So let's let's chat about that. Let's talk about the the bad times. My worst injury was yeah, broke my navicular and three minute tarsals um, in a cross country race, and like didn't run for like four months. Was in a boot on crutches, like. Just terrible, terrible time. Um, so what, but, what year was this? Um, that was um, end of 2017 and then, yeah, so into 2018 as well. Yeah, that was probably the worst and, like, I had to redshirt the track season indoors and outdoors. Um, but then I came back and I ran my PB at the time for 5K and 15, 1500 as well. So, you know, it wasn't it wasn't the worst in the world. I came back from it. But, yeah, just after that I still struggled um, had another metatarsal fracture a year later. Um, and then I did my calcaneus at the end of 2019. Do you reckon just load, load running spikes on the track? I think a combination of like I was wearing shoes that were too small for me. Just the training over there was like pretty intense. Um, I think the problem with the system there is that you're pretty replaceable. Like if you run well, that's great. But then if you don't run well, there's probably five other people who want to take your spot. So okay. um it's not like they really like need you, if that makes sense. Like, um, because there's just so many people who want to run in, in, you know, in the, in these teams. So yeah, right. you know, if you make it, that's great. If you don't, that's fine. We'll find someone else. Um, so when you're feeling a niggle and you'd normally back off, you feel you pretty much have to keep performing to keep that spot. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. And like, I don't know, we're probably training too hard for like some of the sessions we were doing, uh, we're probably too hard for like where, where we're at as like athletes and kind of how we were racing and also I mean we race every every two weeks which is just you know not not normal kind of in the Australian system as we do here but then I had um Marisa Powell who came from um Oregon and she was my coach for the last six months and she was just amazing and I feel like if I'd had her as my coach the whole time 
um, I probably wouldn't have had all those um, injuries and issues. Um, yeah. But yeah, she just she just kind of um, yeah really cared about us as people and um, and I guess knew the right things to do as a coach as well. All right, so nineteen, fantastic. Jump on the uh, on the plane, come back home to Adelaide, and um, get hit with a global pandemic. So, um, yeah. I mean, if anything, in hindsight, it was probably good timing to to get out of the states and and to be back home because um, you know compared to there, we've done reasonably well. What was what was your initial plan? Like, if the pandemic pandemic hadn't hit in two thousand twenty, what was your plan with work and and running and and then what did you um what did you do to uh to get through that uh, hump year? Yeah, so to be honest, like 2019, 2020 was like very challenging time for me um, and pre COVID even because um, essentially when I came third at nationals in the NCAA, um, I was running on a broken foot. I just didn't know that yet. Um, so I'd had plantar fasciitis since May in 2019 and I was running through it, running through it because I really had this massive goal, you know, to be at nationals and to run as well as I could and try and see if I could make, you know, a professional career out of running. Um, and, uh, yeah, nationals, um, next day after nationals, um, I, I couldn't walk. Like my foot was just so messed up. Um, but I still thought it was just plantar fasciitis. So, um, came back to Adelaide. Um, I was heading off to run for Australia at the World University Games in Napoli in Italy. And so okay. I was kind of like limping around, trying to get a little bit of running done, but just, yeah, really crippled and went off to Italy, did a 10K. Um, so painful, you know, it just wasn't quite right. Couldn't walk after that. And then I had to um, not do the 5K. So I was supposed to be going over the 10K and the 5K. Didn't run the 5K. And then um, I actually got an MRI while I was over in Italy um, and they didn't pick anything up for bone stress. And so I had some more treatment over there. And then um, eventually I was back home in Adelaide in August, got it on the scan and um, I had really badly fractured my calcaneus. And so essentially, yeah, it had plantar fasciitis and it had pulled on my calcaneus and actually broken the bone. Um, mm. And so then in August, it made sense why I'd been in so much pain um, for the last two months and nothing that I was doing was really working because, yeah, my, my foot was broken. Um, so at that point there where, yeah, August 2019, I've just moved home. Um, you know, I've left all my friends and my life that I built for the last four or five years over in America. Um, I come home. I love my family. Um, glad to be back with my boyfriend, Riley. But it was a really difficult time just like readjusting to being home, leaving that life behind um, and also being so injured and not being able to run. Um, mm. I really thought about quitting running at that stage. Um, and yeah, I'd go back and forth a lot and, you know, I'd cross train hard for a while and then I'd just be so depressed and um, so upset about my foot. And even into January, I started to try and run again because I was clear to run. Um, and then I got another scan in January 2020 and it was still um, still actually showing up as being fractured. So it was a really long injury and it took probably until March 2020 to get that healthy and be back running again. Yeah, yeah. that is tough. <laughs> That was tough. I think, yeah, just being compiled with like, um, yeah, moving home, that was just tricky. But really, I mean, the pandemic, as much as it's been, um, you know, awful in so many ways for the world, for me, it was kind of good timing to have something that forced me to like um, take a step back and kind of um, just like focus on being healthy and being happy. Um, yep. So there was no races on the schedule that I was trying to work to get back for. So I was working really hard to try and get back to run, you know, maybe in 2020, that early track season. And then once everything was cancelled, it was kind of like, oh, okay, like I can take the time that I need to, like there's no rush. Um, and that just worked really well for me because I started to take the pressure off myself and just do things because I enjoyed them. And slowly, um, you know, my foot started to heal and I was working with a podiatrist and doing all the right things. And um, I ended up having a really good um, domestic winter season, doing cross country, doing some road races in Adelaide and, yeah, things just started to click and eventually I had um, almost a year of healthy training under me and then I, you know, started running some really fast times last year and um, I can just only put that down to um, consistency of training really because I, I hadn't had consistent training for more than six months ever before. Adelaide Road Championship, State <laughs> Championships, yeah, you won that 32-37. So. Yeah. So that's good and, yeah, like you said, it continued on with some, with some good results, 10,000 on the track there. 
32.13 yep. at the States again. Yeah, that 5,000 metre time trial at the night time, 15.41. Who, yep. who got you there? Actually, Rose Davies, yeah. She came over okay. for, um, to, to race that one. It was pretty terrible conditions and um, she ended up, she ran, I think, 15.30 something and um, she closed really well in the last 2K. Um, uh, yeah, and I just kind of um, didn't really have the wheels that night, but then a couple of weeks later, I ran fifteen twenty six. So it was there. It was just um, not not the right night for me. It's 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 so good to be able to um, come out of, of of that dark hole and and to be able to perform again. And yeah. it wasn't so, especially too. I think you you mentioned before, which I didn't actually answer, but essentially I'd finished my degree in America, but um, I I was having this issue where it wasn't getting recognised back in Australia. So I couldn't actually. I was hoping to do my masters in psychology, and I couldn't actually apply to do that because they weren't recognising my undergraduate honours degree. So um, I had to do another appeal and um, tribunal kind of interview thing. Um, and luckily, I won that and got my degree recognised. And now I'm I am doing my masters and PhD um, back here. But for that kind of year. Um, you know, I'm living at home. I'm, I worked in a cafe for a little while. I was volunteering at a school. Like I was doing a few different things, but um, not really. Um, I, I was pretty all over the place. So that was that was tough too, not really knowing what I was doing. 2022, we've got, we got the Worlds over there at Eugene, um, Oregon, which would be mm-hmm. insane. But uh, let's hope we've got, <laughs> got, got our shit together by then. And then the Com Games in Birmingham, now that they're pretty much a week apart. Is there a chance that uh, yourself or other athletes can are able to do both? Yeah, so I have thought about that and, and wondered, but um, I guess like if you're running a marathon, you can't do both. So yeah, we're going to yep. have three different people um, at the Worlds and three different people in the Com Games. Um, mm. But really anything 10K down, you're going to see probably the same or similar team. So, yep. I mean, yep. it, with a 10K being a straight final at, you know, championships, it wouldn't be um, crazy to think that you'd do one 10K and then do a 10K three weeks later or two weeks sure. later. Um, I mean, yep. yeah, I've done that before plenty of times. Um, yep. With the 5K, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, you know, it's, it's a lot to do four 5Ks in the same space as two or three weeks. Um, but, again, yeah. it's not, it's not, it's not, um, it's not unheard of. Um, mm-hmm. But I think that, yeah, well, definitely those like 800, 1500 places are probably going to be the same people. The five and mm-hmm. ten could be like a bit of a mix, um, yeah. and the marathon. I mean, I think you'll see a totally different team. So it'll be yeah. very interesting to see because there are definitely more uh, more sl- spots on teams um, up for grabs in the coming coming year. Yeah. Yeah, because the worlds are July fifteenth to twenty fourth, and then the comms are July twenty eighth to August eighth. Yeah. So I guess it yeah. depends on 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 the uh, yeah how far into those meets yeah. you're at and so on. Yeah, obviously yeah. I haven't seen the schedule for them. Um, I'm not quite sure the exact yeah time between um, between each event, but yeah, I think that there's definitely the um, the ability to run um, you know two championships for an event yep. like ten or the five. So um, it'd be interesting to see. I mean, I'll be so um, overjoyed to make one of those teams or or both. So I'll yep. just have to see what happens, I guess. And uh, you got the Australian Track and Field Championships um, coming up in Sydney uh, in a couple of weeks. Yeah, I'll I'll be at Sydney. Um, I think I'll jump in for a 3K there. There's a national 3K on um, at the Australian Championship, so I'll have a run in that. And um, then I guess after that we'll see whether whether it's a 10K or a 5K and, and go from there. If you had to pick one, would you would you like to lean towards the 10? Such a hard question, honestly. Um, yeah. Until, until March 2nd, I really thought I was not a 5K runner. <laughs> so... Um, I think now I definitely feel that I am a 5K runner. I still do think I'm going to be stronger in that 10K distance um, over the next few years. So um, yeah. I think that's where more where I've got m- more room to grow um, as a runner and, yeah, as I look towards the roads in the coming years. But, um, look, if I make the team for either one of those events, I'll be over the moon. So, You'll be stoked. Um, yeah, yeah I'll, sure. I'll be excited to race either one of those. What about the longer road distances, halves and full marathons? Are they sort of uh... – on the list for the years to come or? Yeah, and I think that, like, if I hadn't have run so well in the 5K this year, um, I would have been more kind of looking towards the road sooner. Um, now I feel like, you know, I've got a few more years in me on the track um, and I really want to work on lowering that 5K and 10K time down. Um, but the marathon and the roads really um, excite me and I'm looking forward to um, exploring them more in the coming years too. And, I, you know, at 25, it's like I've got 
another 10 or so years of good running ahead of me. So plenty of time to work towards those distances. Yeah, yeah. I guess try and pick up some Aussie singlets for the uh, for the shorter ones first. You know, yeah. With these hopefully. majors coming up. Yeah. It's no use, uh, no use rushing. Like I said, you're still pretty young. So Exactly, yeah. Now let's talk about your business that you co-founded uh, with your partner, Riley Cox, Run As One. Um, that running coaching business, it looks like it's just exploded uh, looking at the Instagram pictures. Um, yeah. yeah, tell us about uh, the idea behind all that. Um, yeah, and and basically, I guess, what, what, the, what the business profile about around all that is. Yeah, so I think for me, like um, having Marisa as a coach um, in my last six months in college really showed me um, how powerful having um, a good coach who believes in you is and how powerful like a good environment and culture um, around you is to be a successful athlete and I really also like just having a female coach that I thought that was really um, quite um, powerful as a female runner um, and so coaching has always been something that I've been interested in um, but I thought it might come a bit later in my career. Um, in COVID um, Riley my partner was yeah, just started to help um, his boss, Scott, uh, Riley's a physio. Um, he was just helping Scott um, work towards some events and, you know, look at a marathon and do some ultras. And my mum was running with Scott and then, you know, we started to kind of help them and plan sessions for them. And then, then it became, you know, so-and-so wants to come out and the next week, oh, can so-and-so come out? And suddenly we had five or ten people. Um, a couple of weeks later, we, you know, we had 20 people um, and then we decided we wanted to open it up and, you know, make it more of a, a thing. If people wanted to join in, they could. So um, we came up with a name. Um, I came up with Runners One because our whole ethos was really about getting people to run together um, no matter what level they were at. So if they were running, you know, at our pace or if they were running 30 minutes of 5K, it didn't matter. We were welcoming anyone into the group. Um, so that's kind of where the name came from. Yeah. And then, yeah, so... Really didn't start until um, this is like May June last year when we first started, and then I didn't name the business or really like make it um, make an Instagram or a website until August last year, and then um, now we've got over a, a 120 runners um, on our on our list, and yeah. um, at sessions we have probably 70 people on average out at sessions, and wow. you know I can, wow. I can usually name 20 people that are missing just because yeah. of you know kids work injury whatever can't make it slept in um and then we've got maybe 10 or 15 people who we coach remotely whether they're in rural SA or they can't make the sessions because of work or I've got a couple up in Queensland Gold Coast Geelong um Melbourne so yeah big community and uh yeah as you said it really has exploded and um I think it's nice because it well it happens so organically for us we never really like had like a business plan or you know um, an idea of what it was going to turn into so it's been a massive learning experience and just kind of like um going with the flow and just um making things up as they come along and um we're definitely spending a lot more time on it now um that it's grown so much and it requires um you know more time and effort and planning um we do a time trial kind of fun event every four to six weeks we had one yesterday um, they're always good fun, see people get PVs, run together, uh, that kind of thing. But, yeah, the, everything we do, you know, takes a lot of time to put together. So, um, But, yeah, we love it so much. So it's so powerful, especially for me as a runner. Um, you know, I put so much work in behind the scenes that no one really sees, but I've got this whole community now that really care about me. Um, they all tune into the live stream with their families, with their partners at home. You know, they're sending me messages before mm. my race, after my race. And I think that's just like it's incredibly powerful to feel so um, so supported by people. And um, I, you know, I know that no matter what I do, if I run 15 minutes or 20 minutes, like they'll be proud of me. And that's yeah, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. And you guys have a set session every day, like a, a place that you meet, or? Yeah, so the group meets um, twice a week on Tuesdays and Fridays, and then okay. we often do like a group long run as well, probably every second week. Um, but, yeah, it's just two sessions a week and then um, we write an individualised program for everyone in the group. So um, okay. depending on their schedule and their goals, um, they might run every day, they might run three days three, three days a week or even two days a week. You got the merch done up yet or you haven't got that far yet? No, we've got, we've got singlets and T-shirts and, and hats. Um, yeah. yeah, so and working towards, uh, towards more things. But, 
yeah, it's uh, it's been good. And it's pretty cool to um, go out to events now and see people wearing their runners one tops and you know you go out to park run and you see people in their runners one hats and tops and yeah, it's a real community that's growing, which is really cool to to yeah. be a part of. Yeah, no, well done, fantastic. And uh, and your partner Riley, he's uh he's running PBs at the moment himself. You guys are a good good duo, fives and ten PBs. Um, apparently he's planning on running his first marathon. Is that right? Yeah, so um, you might have heard that Athletes Australia are putting on this marathon in Sydney in um, in April. Mm. It was really only kind of like whispers and rumours for a while and um, yeah, it's yeah. only been really kind of confirmed in the last couple of weeks. Um, but when Riley heard about that, um, he just thought, you know, may as well jump in. Like he's always wanted to be um, into the longer stuff and, yeah. Um, yeah, just give it a go, see what happens. You picked up his first Aussie singlet for the half worlds, but that didn't go ahead due to COVID. So uh, yeah, that was so disappointing. Like, honestly, yeah, such a big, um, such a big milestone for him. Like, yeah. to make that kind of team. Um, I was so sad for him that it didn't go ahead. But yeah. I know that there's plenty more in the tank for him. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. No, it'd be interesting to see how it goes. Uh, hopefully he goes well. It's sub two thirty men, isn't it? And sub two fifty women, I believe, in it, out there at the Penrith um, Rowing Centre. I think the Regatta Centre. Yeah, and look, if he does it, he's not going to be going for um, necessarily trying to bump anyone out for the Olympic qualifying. He's just going to be mm. doing it. Um, yeah, it's just the more first one. Working. It's like, I mean, quite frankly, it's five weeks marathon trainings, not yeah. all that much time to really get after it. Um, but, you know, you've got to take the opportunities that come up. It'd be interesting to see if, if, if there's any guys that can actually grab one of those um, spots because they're going to have to be moving pretty well on the day. Yeah, yeah. They better so- hope they get perfect conditions. Yeah, it's a tricky one. Um, yeah. People have got a lot of different opinions on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I'm wondering if, if one of the three guys have already got that spot. Um, will they even bother doing it just to protect it or just sure, to have a hit not. out? It's really, it's probably too soon before the Olympics to, to run well there. And yeah. The Olympics, it's only 14 weeks. But, um, yeah, yeah, see what happens. be interesting yeah, to see. Yeah, yeah. Well, I assume they'll live stream it, so we should be able to watch it. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, Riley's been doing really well. Like, he um, has had a... Uh, a goal for the last six years to break 14 minutes for 5k and he ran 13.50 last week yeah. uh, in the b race so he's stoked and um we um we've been kind of doing our own thing since november last year he's been coaching himself uh, with the help of a few other mentors so um yep. yeah it's been really um impressive to see what he's been able to do um as a coach and also personally in his own running yeah yeah for sure and being physio do you uh do you ignore or do you take his advice when he says that you should be doing certain exercises? <laughs> um, yeah, no, I take his advice. I try and get I try and get a few calf massages out of him, but that doesn't happen that often. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure, um, exactly. Yep. But, yeah, I mean, since November, he's been um, essentially coaching me um, now um, with the help of Nick Bedeau, um, who's my manager, and helping us with some track sessions. But um, yeah. I, do, I do listen to Riley, and I think that um, as a physio and a runner and, um, you know, being a student of sport for so long, he does have so much to offer and he knows so much. So as much as sometimes I get frustrated by him, um, uh, I do trust most most of the things he says and take his his advice when he gives it. Yeah, 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 for sure. It's, it's always different when it's coming uh, from your partner. Um, yeah, definitely. All right, Izzy, look, that's a wrap. Thank you so much for giving up uh, giving up your time today. Um, oh, no worries. Thanks for having me on. No, it's been great. All the best for all the races coming up. Hopefully you can find uh, – Olympic qualifying time somewhere to, uh, to get to Tokyo. Yeah, um, thank you. Yeah, fingers crossed. But otherwise, I'm pretty sure um, you're going to be picking up a lot of uh, Aussie singlets for some major champs in the years to come. Uh, there's a long way to go for Izzy, I think. So, yeah, all the best. Uh, can I work a link over to uh, over to your socials and, and over to that run yeah, as one? Yeah, absolutely, yep. of course. I'm yep, pretty active awesome. on Instagram and Strava, so feel free yep. to follow along. Yeah, yeah, I'll chuck it all on there. But, um, yeah, all right, awesome. I'll let you go. Thank you very much, Izzy. All right, have a great rest of the day. Cheers. Cool, thank you. Okay, bye.